Hello everybody. Happy to virtually meet you all in this event. I am Radha Lakshmi from Site Twenty Four Seven, and uh, I will be sharing some tips on how you optimize your operations and uh, container lifecycle management. Most of us are having our products moving to the cloud, are adopting the container model. and i have been in the industry for the past 22 years based on my experience i am here to share some tips let's get started so before i get into the actual container life cycle adoption and the industry starts on what are the various technologies that are being used and how you can do go about with the operations and optimizations i would like to start off with the evolution with a short history of how things have evolved in the past from what it was 20 years ago when i started as a product software developer to what it is today everything revolves around application building so how has the application architecture itself has evolved just a quick introduction so it's all around client server architecture so you have a server component you have a client component and how they interact so this is how a typical client server architecture used to be possibly two decades ago we have a server component in the backend and then the client sometimes the client is also within the on premise system running in one corner of your office premise and you connect with your server that's how client server architecture typically was then with web 2.0 the cloud when it started picking up where all along that time frame the web was only considered a medium of consuming content but with web 2.0 the web was also considered a medium of contributing content people started writing their own content and uploading it people started taking videos and photos and uploading it so there are lot of content on the cloud and there used there there needed tools for collaborative working environment so with web 2.0 the client server architecture changed to the server can be anywhere in the cloud and then clients can connect from across the globe so that was the transformation that happened and then with cloud picking up the public cloud servers there are various providers who are able to give the service the cloud services behind started picking up cloud servers public cloud servers but people did not or the businesses did not completely move to the public cloud there were some portions which still remain on premise even today there are on premise solutions that are still being followed in businesses so it became a hybrid model i can have a mix of public cloud as well as private cloud and still communicate and collaborate and work together as a system so that is the model that is predominantly followed even today so this is how the evolution has been and if i have to put it in uh, another terminology another way of representing it what used to be a monolith architecture where uh, even though you have different components you have the user interface component you have the business logic you have data access layer and then the you know uh, uh, database layer as different components all of them acted as one monolith system if there is a failure the entire system fails so that was the monolith architecture so from monolith architecture things have changed to microservices architecture where each of these be it your business logic or your uh, data accessing layer or your caching layer or your uh, authorization and authentication layer or your payment gateway layer each of them can be run on its own in a small container each of them can be spawned you can work on it you can deploy you can um, you can bring that down all that can be done independently but all of this still work as a one system so that's the transformation from monolith architecture to microservices is what the industry is moving towards and one step ahead of this or the next thing that is happening is the serverless we i don't even want to have any server layer i will just be having functions for all of these components that i'm talking about and um, but still come up with an application so all of this we are talking with respect to building applications because that's what is at the end of the day where the business logic is there so 
So I don't even want to own the server. I will just have functions and completely deploy my application. Using function as a service is something that is picking up which the organizations and businesses are moving towards. So from monolith to microservices to serverless is the other way of putting that journey of the application evolution. So with all this in place, what are the typical various layers that are there in any cloud architecture? We are talking about application development in a cloud. So what are the various layers? There are four layers. There are many layers, but I have categorized them as four layers. And the topmost is the end user layer, which comprises of your web browsers, your mobile applications, or your tablets, using which your customers connect to the underneath application layer, which is nothing but software as a service. So there are many such software as a service model vendors available where which actually host the business logic. If you are a business owner, you have to be worried more about this software as a service model where actually your business logic is hosted and leave the rest to, if you are using public clouds, you can leave the rest to the vendors on whom you are deployed. So the application, that's the application layer. And underneath is your platform layer, which is again platform as a service model which comprises of your caching servers, your SQL databases, no SQL databases, queues, microservices, all of this comprises the platform layer and there are vendors to give platform as a service model. And underneath the bottom most is your infrastructure layer, which comprises of physical servers, virtual servers, cloud servers, your load balancer, firewall, router, switch, the entire network, all of them form the infrastructure layer. Again, infrastructure as a service is a model that is available. So why am I talking about all these four layers and why is it important? In a cloud architecture, even though you are mostly worried about only your application, the person has to know the IT administrator or the application owner or the developer, the DevOps, SRE, whatever role you talk them about, you name, you have to have a complete picture of what is happening in all these layers. So the end-to-end -end visibility across all these layers is important because we are talking about things in the cloud. If something goes wrong, your website or your application is down, the downtime could be anywhere in this layer. It could be because of an uh, ISP problem in your end user layer or it could be because of a, a router or a particular port in a particular switch is not working in your infrastructure layer. The problem could be anywhere or in your application, the line of code, there is a bug in your code which is causing an indefinite looping. Or it could be in your database layer where the connection has not been closed properly. We can attribute to n number of factors that can be a reason for something going wrong in your cloud architecture. Being in the cloud, you cannot have any downtime. So such being the case, what are we going to do? How are we going to manage? So end-to-end -end visibility across all these layers is important. And let's look at where does this uh, container architecture and what are the important things that we need to know of when we move to the containerized microservice architecture world. So Kubernetes, let's look at some quick stats. So I've been reading through some articles to know the adoption of Kubernetes and uh, there was an uh, article from VMware that talked about the state of Kubernetes and there was this article in 2020 and again, a survey was down, done and uh, 2021, there were stats that were put up. So I'm just giving a comparison of these two. So organizations that use Kubernetes in production has grown from 59% in 2020 to 65%. So we are seeing predominantly more and more organizations that are using Kubernetes, not just for their development, but also for their production. And organizations also say the beauty of Kubernetes is it can be deployed even on-premise or it can be deployed in multi-cloud and still work together. So people who, who are having monolith architecture in their on-premise who cannot afford to move to any cloud have also started using Kubernetes so that it can be, it can, we can be uh, gradually moved to the cloud or it can work in sync with their public cloud deployment as well. So the organizations that are deploying Kubernetes and on-premise, it was 64% in 2020, but slowly with things moving to the cloud, the on-premise deployment is reducing, but still there, are, there, is, there is enough or there is enough adoption for Kubernetes and on-premise. And uh, there have been people who, the important challenge that if you have to talk about in moving to any 
or particularly the Kubernetes technology is lack of experience and expertise has been quoted as the top deployment challenge. And uh, the stats have proven that that deploy that lack of experience and expertise is gradually coming down because people are uh, appreciating the importance on gaining that expertise slowly. So, but still there is a long way to go. That's why there are still 65% of people who feel that lack of experience and expertise is the top challenge. So going, moving along and uh, to talk about the benefits from Kubernetes based on this same survey that was done, 58% of people have felt that usage of Kubernetes have helped them in improving the resource utilization. So resource utilization, there is also another study that states, uh, that states that when we move to the cloud, there are a lot of unused resources and, uh, and there are a lot of, almost 30% of resources are being wasted. So that being the case, Kubernetes helps in improving your resource utilization. And 46% of people have felt that it is shortening your software development life cycle. We are moving towards the agile model and we want to do quicker releases. The sh shortening of software development life cycle is important for your business needs. And 41% of people have felt containerizing this monolith application is possible using Kubernetes because it has the advantage of having an on-premise setup as well. 48% have felt that it has eased their application upgrades and maintenance. It's easy for you to do uh, it in deployment. And 28% of people feel that it has reduced the public cloud cost because it can be a combo and when using Kubernetes have helped them to reduce their public cloud cost. 39% have felt that, that it has enabled their move to the cloud because people thought that they will not be able to, able to move to the cloud otherwise and uh, Kubernetes helped them in moving to the cloud. So these are all some of the benefits which are, uh, the, I've just taken one survey, there are many articles that talks about the benefits and the challenges as well. So if you have to put all these benefits in uh, one diagram with respect to using the uh, Kubernetes, Kubernetes is one of the containerized model which people are adopting more and more. It's because it's very portable and flexible model. It's simple. I've just uh, categorized them and put it as points here. You can have it in multi-cloud deployment. You need not be just stuck with only one cloud vendor. You can, because it is multi-cloud, it's easy for you to change the vendor in case you want to change. And you can also have a local model. On-premise Kubernetes model also is possible. Scaling, when, when we take cloud and when we take containerization, easy scaling, faster scaling is possible and it is a reliable solution and it's open source, open source. The beauty of any open source technology is you get a lot of help from other experts who will be able to help you if you face any problem and they are the market leaders. So these are some of the benefits which people have seen and we are also seeing when we want to move our monolith architecture to the containerized world, particularly the Kubernetes model. Now let's look at some of the challenges. What are the, we saw lack of expertise as the top challenge that was quoted in the survey. Let me also cite some of the challenges based on our interaction with some of our customers and based on how we ourselves have been, uh, the challenges that we faced when we moved our setup to the container model. So let's look at some of the challenges. These are not in any particular order, but these are predominantly the major challenges that are being faced. And the first is the lack of expertise. Because we don't know what is happening underneath. You have to understand the technology and understand the deployment clearly. That is when you will be able to do the configuration correctly. So that is the challenge that people are facing. Because human mind is more like we are stuck with or we are comfortable with what we know and we don't want to come out of it and learn new things and adopt ourselves with the latest technologies. That's an hindrance that pretty much many people face and that is being that is the major challenge that is being faced. But we can see people are coming out of their comfort zone and trying to become expert because that's how, that's how you can be at least on the go in this technical world. So that is the major challenge which industries are facing. Getting the proper expertise in the people is the major challenge. And the other important challenge is the deployment complexities. Even though the microservice architecture, the container containers, each each one can be spawned, deployed on its own, these all look very simple, but 
the complexity lies in the actual deployment and managing and monitoring them to the outside world it is very simple it's a cool thing to do it in an architectural diagram but the actual deployment people know who are working on it will know the deployment complexity so that's again another challenge and there are a lot of monitoring that you need to need to do around it because it is being on the cloud you have to make sure that all your key performance metrics are being monitored all of the all of the components have to be up and running all the time and they have to be performing very quickly have uh, quicker turnaround and response times that is that is when you will be able to have your production setup up and running so and configuring them automating them applying some configuration rules so you have to monitor all of them using the right tools and that's again another challenge people usually neglect that part and deploying it in the cloud once you take it to production later on when you face a problem you it will be very challenging to find out where the problem is for which tools will really help and the other important challenge is security being in the cloud configuring things properly making sure that one user's data is not visible to the other user and you make sure that security is taken care at all the layers in your cluster architecture be it in your pod or in your node or in your cluster in your service all of them is important from your database design to how you deploy how you show it in your client security plays a major role and that's again another challenge and complying with all the compliances based on the geographical region is another challenge and uh, this we have seen few people say this and we have also felt this even though it might look like everything is taken care it is sometimes it feels that it is like a black box and we don't have control of the underlying framework so loss of control has been cited as few challenges or one of the challenge by few people and the other challenge is the scaling cost scalability is an advantage we saw that in the benefits as well but you have to do it rightly not that every deployment or every um, everything that you need to do have to be taken to the cloud or have to be taken to the containerized world do, do not try to do things because somebody else is doing your your application is different your environment is different your customers are different you have to really evaluate if you really have to move towards a containerized option itself you you end up converting everything to the container architecture just because that's the latest technology sometimes it might backfire and it might cost you heavily so depending on what is the need you might want to sometime have it in your local on premise itself or have it in a fixed server instead of going for an auto scaling environment or you have to go for an auto scaled environment based on your requirement so it's based on the application and the functionality that it does the technology has to be chosen lot of time people struggle just because it's a latest technology adopt that and then find out that it's going to cost them more and that's again another challenge so these are some major challenges that i wanted to bring it bring it uh, to you and uh, let's look at the monitoring needs how do we overcome the challenges most of the challenges be it your scaling cost or your monitoring needs or your deployment uh, configurations all of most of them that I, that i talked about can be taken care of with uh, with the help of tools and with monitoring needs and when we talk about monitoring needs when this is a typical uh, kubernetes architecture that comprises of your entire cluster the node and then your uh, uh, kubelet and pod and this is how it is and you need to make sure that all of them are up and running so when we talk about monitoring i would like to associate the monitoring into these three pillars of observability that we call the first one is metrics in metrics in kubernetes what are the things that you have to take care of then we will i will just give a quick overview because the pillars of observability itself can be talked at length so when we talk about metrics that's the first pillar of observability the key metrics are availability the different components that we saw be it your node or your pod or your cluster all of them have to be up and running it 99.999% five nines up time is what the industry expects make sure they are up and running that's one of the important metric and the second important metric is performance there is no point in having all the components up and running if they are going to be performing very very slow so make sure all those components are doing their work in a 
high speed environment because that's the industry expectation nobody has the time or patience to sit, sit and look through pages that are going to take forever to load we just move on to the next pages we just move on to the next service or the application make sure your kubernetes all your layers are performing very good for which tools are important so when we talk about metrics availability and performance are the important metrics that have to be taken care and the second pillar is traces so in traces what does trace mean you know uh, you know your uh, um, your application that is deployed is taking some 10 seconds to load you need to know exactly where it is taking more time and in a distributed architecture in a containerized environment each of these containers can be spawned and uh, spawned uh, it can do its function and destroyed on its own so that in that situation how do you know which node is taking more time which line of code is taking more time so that is the trace tracing to the exact line of code that is causing issue so that is tracing across all the application platforms that is available and that's what traces will give you so in a distributed architecture where each of these containers or each of these um, each of this can be written in its own language too your authentication service can be written in a different language your payment service can be in a different language but still if there is a problem you must be able to tra track and trace to the line of code and that is what is trace and the third pillar is logs it's all distributed architecture and when anything goes wrong we have to go for debugging we have to look at the logs and it is not possible for the it administrator to take remote control of each of the distributed architecture it, the system has deployed in and look at what is happening in each of the log files so you need to collect all those logs process it and store it in such a way it is easy for you to query and see where the problem is so converting your unstructured data into a structured data is what is log management and that's one of the, that's the third pillar for observability so putting all these three together metrics traces logs make sure the tool that you are trying to use has all these three components so that you can rely on that tool let me quickly give some sample screenshots of what all you need to look at in a monitoring solution the health dashboard has to be there be it your node or your pod or your services how many of them are up and how many of them are down what are the top cpu intensive pods top memory intensive pods all of these in a health dashboard is important inventory when once you give one particular cluster detail you must be able to get all your nodes pods your deployments endpoints replica sets how many services are there and what are their availability and performance the inventory dashboard is important and the business view the infrastructure view of the nodes and the cluster the nodes and pods to show you exactly where the problem is and about that's about the metrics this is about the traces to show you the line of code that is having issue and about the log management collecting all your kubernetes containers and uh, nodes logs and looking at them in one place just log type equal to container logs you must be able to get all the logs that have been collected so that you can find where and what is the problematic node so these three these are some things that you have to look for and those are not just those are for monitoring not just monitoring sometimes you may have to take some actions because you know there is a there is a problem you may have to do some action on it and your tool must be able to help you have some nodes and pods and your pod is continuously failing or unable to restart what do you do manually you have to manually reboot which is time consuming you have to take remote control and do it in a manual way instead you must be able to take write some scripts with, which does automatically the reboot and associated with the threshold profile when you see that the pod's cpu is increasing you must be able to or when your pod is not responding for continuously for three times or five times do a restart such actions should be possible another example is when your cpu is high you may want to free up some resources again you can write some script and you can associate that with your threshold when your cpu is node cpu is greater than 90% go and clean up the process which will reduce the cpu all those manual things that you usually do should be automated using the scripts and associating it with those actions and see if your tool that you are selecting has all this so that it makes it easy for you in your live deployment when you identify a problem half of the problem once you have identified and you want to make some corrections 
they have to be done automatically so that it is seamless for the end user and your end users are not impacted because of these problems in the system. So find, finding out a right tool and monitoring using the right tool is what is important. Those could address your challenges. In addition, when you are looking for such tools, you can choose any tool for your monitoring needs. In addition to the challenges that are being, that we discussed and in addition to the pillars of observability that we discussed which you have to look for, I would say you have to look for additionally three more things. I call it as look for ICE. I stands for integration, C for customization and E for extension. So I'll just quickly tell what this is. All of us, when we are having our deployments, we will have some in-house metrics that are being collected. So the tool that you are selecting should have the integrability option so that you can do all your import export in a seamless manner. It shouldn't be as data silos. You have to integrate everything and you must be able to view. Sometimes you may want to export it to a, you export your alert to some third party that you are already using. All those import export options should be available. API options should be available. See if the tool supports that such things. That is the integrability. Customization. I don't want to use whatever you're giving out of the box. I may want to change the color. I may want to change the text. I may want to do some other option based on my need. See if the tool is having such customizability options. And extensibility, API support. I don't want drag and drop and build your own dashboard. We are living in this era of citizen coders where people don't want to take out of the box whatever is given. Give me the flexibility to do things of my own as what is what is expected in this generation kids. So we have your, the tool that you are using, you are building or the tool that you are planning to use should have this extensibility option. But at the same time, it has to work. It's not that I can extend, but it will not work. So make sure it is extensible. So look for ICE integration, integrability, customizability and extensibility. So there are many tools in the market. Site 24 7 is one such tool. It's an AI powered full stack monitoring tool that lets you take care of all your monitoring needs in one single console from your I talked about the various layers. So from your end user layer to your infrastructure layer, we have monitoring for all the needs. You can also monitor your containers, be it your Docker containers or your Kubernetes. Monitoring for all of them is available. On top of all this, we do have alerting, reporting and integrations, dashboards, all of that is possible. And uh, Site247 is hosted on Zoho's data center. So we do have our data, data centers, our own data centers, 10 different data centers in five different regions. So depending on your region, you can choose the data center. We have it in US, Europe, China, India and Australia. Your data will reside within the geographical boundaries of that particular data center that you are selecting. Being a cloud provider, we do take privacy, security and compliance very seriously and get all the certifications that are required. So we have been in the industry, Zoho has been in the industry for the past 25 years. Site 24-7 as a product has been in the industry for close to 15 years now. So we are a mature product in the market. Just feel free to try it out and see for yourself. I would like to finish off with this, uh, uh, with a small snippet from this book. This is one of my favorite uh, books. I'm sure many of you would have read this book. If not the book, I'm sure many of you would be aware of this golden circle. Start with a why, why, how and what. I want you to apply this in anything and everything that you do in business as well. So you should uh, start with your why, the purpose, the five why technique. Why am I doing this? Do I really have to move to a cloud native technology? Do I have my system is already working fine? So what are the pros and cons in moving to a Kubernetes, adopting a Kubernetes or any other container orchestration for that matter? So ask your five whys depending on your application. And if you really know it is the reason that you will get the purpose, that is when you have to go ahead with the next of how and what you have to do. So start with your why. Once you are clear with your why, how is just the process? How you want to monitor, what tool you want to use, you want to build your own tool or use some third party tool available. That's all in the process. If you are clear with your why and choosing the right things in how to do the result, what is the end result, you will definitely be successful in whatever you're doing. Keep that in mind. Don't do things just because somebody else is doing. Everybody's requirements is different. 
so depending on your application depending on your customers you have to choose what you want to do so key takeaways from this session uh, the three important points we just talked about the evolution of application architecture itself how things have moved from monolith to microservices to serverless and all about kubernetes some stats some trends and benefits and challenges and the monitoring needs and how you, how and what are the things that you need to monitor and site 24/7 itself is an ai powered full stack monitoring tool that can help you monitor your entire infrastructure from top to bottom from your end user layer to your infrastructure layer including the application and the platform layer so i'll just finish off with this one quote this is my favorite favorite quote one of my favorite quotes this is called the red queen's quote and this comes in the book alice in wonderland and i haven't i did not read this book when i was a child but i remember reading it for my children so the quote goes like this you have to be running as fast as you can in order to stay in the same place and if you want to make any progress you have to run twice as fast as you can this is generally applicable for individuals or for our business too most of the time we are living in this world where the technology is evolving in a very fast manner so if we don't keep ourselves updated we will be outdated though so this is applicable for individuals as well as for business so at zoho at site 247 we make sure that we adopt all the latest technologies and pass that benefit to customers i'm sure as users you also would want to do that keep yourself updated thank you so much for your time i hope i was able to give few tips on what you need to do in your container world you can reach me in uh, any of the social media platform or through email and for anything related to the product you can write to either you can write to me or to the support email id that is available here i didn't get into the product details we will arrange an one on one session and we can arrange for a demo demonstration if required we do have a free version that is available and we do have uh, um, what is that 6 months free subscriptions that are available for you to try it out and see so feel free to reach out to us and enjoy the rest of the session in the event have a nice day thank you